Good evening. Thank you all for joining us on this rainy Wednesday evening. My name is Anita Pepper. I'm Vice President of Institutional Advancement at the Wistar Institute. And uh, today we're going to talk about Zika and what you need to know. We have a very distinguished panel of researchers from both the clinic and from the basic research side and in between. And I'm going to introduce Paul Offit, who is director of the Vaccine Education Center, Division of Infectious Disease at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And as Paul may tell you, he learned everything he needs to know about science at the Wistar Institute. Perfect. OK. <laughs> so welcome, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. So here's how this is going to work. It's a panel discussion. Um, I will ask questions of the panel probably for about 45 minutes. They may or may not show slides associated with the questions that I ask. Um, and then there will be plenty of time for you to ask questions, if, if, we, if we may be even asking questions earlier than that. But for, I'm going to begin by introducing our four panelists. Uh, first, we have Gary Covinger. They're all labeled, so you can tell who's who. Gary is a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases and director of the Research Center in Infectious Diseases at the Faculty of Medicine at the Université Laval. Uh, Naranjan Sar Sardesai is the chief operating officer of Inovia Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Pablo Tebas is a professor of medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And our own David Weiner is the executive the vice president of the Wistar Institute, director of the Wistar Institute uh, Vaccine Center, and the W.W. Smith Charitable Trust professor in cancer research. OK, so my other thing here, thank you for stealing that. OK, good. OK. Um, David, we'll start with you. So, so I guess the first question is, is, is Zika a new virus or is it a newly recognized virus? I mean, how long has this virus been around? So we can go to the first, first slide, slide. Which, which we have, right? Oh, here it is. I, I, can, I can advance it for you. So um, Zika uh, was originally identified from uh, infected sentinel macaques that were placed in the Zika forest of Uganda, which is in East Africa, in 1947. And this, uh, within a very short period of time, a virus was isolated, these little circles, um, from uh, other macaque uh, studies. And this virus was found to be transmitted by mosquitoes. Nope, oh, that's it for you. OK, good. No, that's on. Down. That's it. You'll notice, by the way, that Zika forest is spelled Z-I-I-K-A, whereas we spell it Z-I-K-A. So, so see, it's grammatically incorrect. And when you do that, when you challenge the grammar gods, bad things happen. <laughs> OK, Pablo, um, the, the, my understanding is that about 80% of Zika virus infections are asymptomatic, but 20% are. So could you just tell us about the, um, the clinical symptoms, then, of uh, people who are infected with Zika? So most people don't know that they got Zika or had Zika. The people that get symptomatic Zika, they feel bad. They feel like a flu-like illness. They feel tired with muscle aches, headache, sometimes a little bit of retroorbital pain, similar to other viruses that infect people in that area, like dengue or, or chikungunya, at least at the beginning. So there is really not a very specific clinical symptom. And some people develop a rash, which is very characteristic and a little bit of conjunctival injection, but it's not specific, so it happens with other infections. So I, there has been not many, not many cases here in the Philadelphia area. Uh, I think there are th 35 cases, the people that travel to Zika areas and came back to Philly, and I can show you the pictures of how the rash looks like in somebody that had Zika. So she is a medical uh, uh, a, a student that came back from Guatemala for a field trip and was not feeling well for a week, and when she developed this rash in the face and in the upper torso. If you put the next slide, you can see this redness around the chest and in the back, very itchy. People that have Zika, they say it's itchy. And I had a friend from Brazil that had Zika that told me it's like an itch from the inside. I don't know what he meant with that, but it's like needles coming from the inside of your body. It's itchy. So when clinicians see this, think about allergic reactions, because it's a rash, and maybe you took something, and it's allergic reaction. But in, if you came from an endemic area where it's Zika, and you have tiredness, and you develop this rash, you should be thinking about Zika. Next slide, you see the conjunctival injection. 
So in the eye, you see that redness in the eye, that's the conjunctiva, and that's the injection. And she went to student health and was told that she had an allergic reaction. And she said, I don't think so. My family <coughs> had the same things that I have, and I am worried about Zika, so please send a test. And she was positive for Zika. That's when I got involved. So you have to think about it. It's not a very serious, in most cases, not a very serious illness, except if you're pregnant or you develop a rare comp neurological complication. And I think David is going to talk about that. Okay, so, so the next question then, David, is for you. I, I was watching um, CNN, um, the morning show, with Alison Camerata and uh, Chris Cuomo, and, and they had Tony Fauci on. Tony Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and Alison was stunned. She was stunned that this, this virus had traveled from Puerto Rico to, or from Brazil, I think she said, from Brazil up into Miami. This was right when the first few cases were being reported on Broward County. And she said it just it amazed her, actually, that a mosquito could fly that far. That was her question to Tony Fauci, who, who to his credit, uh, never smiled or said anything like, what, are you stupid? No, he didn't do that. Um, mosquitoes, as it turns out, don't fly really more than 500 feet from where they were born, and they only live for about two weeks, so it would be the, the world's longest mosquito trip ever. But so my question to you is, um, how, how has um, Zika traveled across the globe, and, 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 and by what means does it travel? So I think we have uh, the next slide, if I'm not mistaken. Right, so this uh, map shows uh, how Zika has traveled. Uganda, 1947-48, first identified. And the isolated virus I showed you, well, actually I didn't show you, it was from a monkey. This is on a human host in 1953 in Nigeria. But the infection traveled east this direction. And then the largest outbreak was in 2007, um, 8,007 uh, uh, in the Yap Islands, 2007, 8,000 cases. And then back to through French Polynesia, and then eventually to Brazil in 2015. David, you want a pointer? Point. Sure. In 2015, and then moved up the through Central America and the Caribbean to where it eventually got to Florida. It travels by people moving that are, have uh, high levels of virus in their blood and mosquitoes biting. And, and uh, they can travel, of course, in boats. They can travel in airplanes. But they travel, people travel, and the mosquitoes, which tend to be endemic in this entire middle portion, um, can then feed on them and continue the spread. Thank you. Okay, Gary. Um, Zika is a flavivirus. I mean, like other flav there are other flaviviruses like yellow fever virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, dengue virus, um, you know, which can be quite serious. Um, yellow fever can cause hepatitis and death. Um, dengue also can cause hemorrhagic fever and death. Japanese encephalitis virus is a severe, can cause a severe form of encephalitis. How, how is Zika similar to or different from these other flaviviruses? Is it bad as they are, or is it, is it uh, more, much more benign? Well, I think what, what's very interesting with Zika is um, initially the amount of knowledge, when you think about it, in 1947, that's a long time ago, and there is very little that is known on the consequences of having a Zika infection. And so initially, it goes from, well, it's not probably not much because it has been circulating for so long. But then the more uh, it's being looked at and the more there is uh, consequences that were not observ observed from the beginning. And then you wonder why. But there's a lot to do with, uh, with uh, uh, following uh, what happened to people that are sick. And so from, from surveillance system in Africa, for example, where the virus has been circulating for a long time, it was not uh, detected. Um, the consequences, inclu including microcephaly, that were, uh, you know, uh, highlighted uh, following the infection and the spread in Brazil. So I think with, the, with this emerging infection, it's not so much when they emerge, it's, it's the, the amount of knowledge that we uh, accumulate uh, and when we accumulated, and, and basically Zika um, has been a very recent explosion of new knowledge uh, on this virus infection. And I'm going to show a little bit later 
the, some of the consequences that just uh, came to light uh, in the past few weeks uh, about the Zika infection. Um, maybe, maybe we can actually skip ahead to that. I, I mean, so, so right now we, we've talked about the virus, we've talked about, it. Pablo has told us that it's actually not terribly severe. I mean, it, it can cause, you know, headache and conjunctivitis and rash, which generally are short-lived short -lived and don't cause permanent sequelae. So it's sort of like rubella in that sense, that it's, a, you know, sort of generally mild infection, but it has a severe consequence. So maybe we can, if we're going to talk about a vaccine, then by definition, this has to be a severe disease worth preventing. And um, if rubella only caused that mild infection of childhood, we wouldn't have been as prone to be interested in preventing. There's a reason we wanted to prevent rubella, which we'll get to in a second. But maybe you can talk about um, the what are the severe consequences of a rubella. You and Gary can talk about that. Um, I don't know. Maybe I just screwed up the slides thing. But what's the next slide? Let's take a look. Um, well, this spread. is still transmission, so we kind of covered that. All right, and there. Then we're at complications. So, the, the, so you want to go to this? Yeah, you know, the, the main clinical complication is if you are a pregnant woman and you get infected, particularly during the first trimester, but maybe later, even later, you can have problems with your uh, baby. The virus in, uh, infects the brain and can produce this very dramatic uh, damage in the brain called microcephaly. So, or the baby dies in utero or uh, is born with this very severe defect in the brain. So that, how often that happens? It's around one in 10 probably in pregnant women that get infected early during the pregnancy with Zika, maybe less later. The problem is also that we don't know what is the long-term consequences, what is gonna happen to kids that uh, got Zika in utero 10 years from now when, when they grow up. So we don't know, we know them only very dramatic neurological complications. We don't know what's happening later on. Um, there is cohort studies following this kid long term to see what, and that creates an incredible amount of anxiety in the parents, okay? This is, that's the main problem. And then there is another neurological complication, which is different. This is for the people that get Zika. They can get uh, an autoimmune problem, so it's called Guillain-Barré, it's uh, ascending paralysis, so you cannot move, you can be very severe, ill, you might have to be in bed for a while because you cannot stand up and move around and it can have long-term sequela. It's called Guillain-Barré. It doesn't happen that often. It's one in every 5,000. But in countries where they have a lot of Zika cases, they saw a peak on cases of microcephaly that they didn't know. That's in Brazil, in some areas of Brazil. And then also a peak of this Guillain-Barré syndrome that has been associated with other infections. But with Zika, it happens in one every 5,000, and it's a potential very severe neurological complication. So there are some photos of after this. So if you want to go through the, so this is the microcephaly. Yeah, you see the CT, in the CT, which is a cut of the brain, you see this severe atrophy of the brain, and you see these very dramatic pictures of babies with, with the brain basically shrink and occupied by these the ventricles. And so I mean, you see this here, the microcephaly, very, and because the brain is collapsing, the, the, the bones of the, of the head also collapse. And then when you do a cut on a CT, you can see there is a lot of these, the ventricle, the brain is substituted by fluid, literally. And these kids have obviously a learning impairment and many of them died very early in life. And there's another one. Oh, there's not. No, oh, there it is. There's another baby with microcephaly. And I have some malformations in, in, in the hands or neurological. I mean, this is neurological sequela of the problems in the brain. So your point is, is that this is a this is a, a, a gross finding, an obvious finding, but that there may be more subtle findings that come up later where the child may have eye findings or, or, or deafness or developmental delays, et cetera, learning problems. And we don't know all about all of them yet. Right. So I will say, add to that though, we, we know now that um, neuronal uh, progenitor cells are also killed by Zika infection, and we do not know the consequences of those. And those are the cells that um, those stem cells give rise to a um, 
prevent early onset Parkinson's, uh, dementia, and Alzheimer's. So, so the consequences of loss of those cells, which you might not see these growth defects, um, are something that there's a lot of concern about. You, you know, some of you, at least some people in this audience are probably too young to remember rubella virus or German measles virus, but that was a virus that when it affected pregnant women in the first trimester of pregnancy, 85% of those babies were then born with severe birth defects of the eye, ear, or heart. I mean, it was a scourge. There would be 20,000 babies in this country who would be born with permanent birth defects or who may, the mother, there would be 5,000 cases a year of spontaneous abortions. And so there was a desperate need to prevent uh, that virus with a vaccine, and so a vaccine was developed. It was called the RA273 vaccine. It was so effective, it eventually eliminated rubella from this country by the year 2005, and that vaccine was developed at the Wistar Institute. See, this is a, because nobody, that was never written down for me. I just want to say. Um, but it was so bad, actually, in Philadelphia in 1962 that one out of every 100 births, I'm not talking about one out of every 100 births where the, it was a known rubella infection, one out of every 100 births in the city of Philadelphia was complicated by congenital rubella syndrome. So, so you don't know. I mean, mothers would be scared to death that they would get pregnant and be infected with this virus. The rubella was not typically asymptomatic, but Zika is. So you may have an, a Zika infection, have an asymptomatic infection, never know you were infected, and yet still develop, you know, either severe or subtle birth defects that you know come up later. That's the horror of this virus. Yeah, in fact, that they discover the clinical symptoms after the microcephaly. So the mother would present, why my kid is looking funny? And they ask, did you have any problems during the pregnancy? And they will remember, oh, I had some flu-like thing, or I didn't have any problems. But, and that's when they discover backwards that these, these patients have had exposure to Zika. All right, David. So I will. I'll get you next. The the um, so and so there's there's this is a virus which can cause severe and permanent birth defects, and there's therefore a desperate need to prevent that because there is no specific treatment for it, right? So the the best chance is to prevent this infection. So hence a vaccine. So so how when you when you're thinking about that when you're trying to imagine how to develop a vaccine, how, I mean there's a lot of different strategies for how one develops a vaccine. How do you think about this one? So. Well, with Gary, um, Joseph, Young, uh, Narenjin, and Pablo, uh, and um, um, Joel were all involved in discussions early on of, well, you guys have a technology that might be useful here that's been shown to be very safe in people, that produces immune responses that you can make and deliver, you should consider targeting this virus, and so we had discussions about what part to target, discussions, and Manny um, in the lab really uh, championed the program, uh, Dr. Mutumani, and um, said, well, how would we go about that? And at that time, we didn't have assays for Zika. We didn't have an, an, uh, a vaccine release assay such as neutralization. There were no none developed. There were no animal models. And so the team sort of divided up work and sort of approached that. I think on the next slide uh, shows a sort of a cartoon of the virus, the circles, and those um, cartoon blow up to what's called the E protein, the part of the virus that actually binds and allowing infection. And that red circle is the part that we genetically made into a molecular synthetic DNA vaccine that showed um, protection and Gary developed, uh, Gary's lab developed challenge models that allowed us to actually test disease and um, also study antibodies that could protect and bind. And, and uh, Emma did T cells um, with uh, the Novio and then that vaccine was uh, studied in several ma small animal models and uh, non-human primate models and then uh, Anovio and Gene One scaled it up and produced a prototype vaccine for movement and do, did safety and development work to move that into the clinic. Well, let me ask you a question. So, so, you, you, so there's a lot of different ways one can make a vaccine. Jonas Salk made a polio vaccine by taking polio virus and killing it. Albert Sabin made a polio virus vaccine by taking polio virus and weakening it. And the same, the same strategy is used to make the measles or mumps or rubella or chickenpox vaccine, take viruses and weaken them. You can take a hepatitis B vaccine or a human papillomavirus vaccine by just taking one protein from the virus, yet you chose a DNA approach. Well, why that? Why not the others? 
I'm going to get to you in a second, Naranjan. I have, I have a harder question for you. Well, well um, so a DNA is, has been in uh, about 30,000 plus people with no significant adverse events related to the vaccine itself. The technology we've been working on for several years and developed other vaccines that have moved forward into the clinic together as a group actually include e Ebola as well as the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which plagued uh, Korea last year. Um, and so we had a lot of experience and we also had a plan we could put together. But the major reasons were sort of non-live vaccine, very safe, very reproducible, uh, a manufacturing process, a delivery process, and, uh, and also it can be produced extremely rapidly. And so we didn't have tremendous concerns when we started out. We had to test it, of course, to be sure that there were going to be novel significant adverse events with a shot in the arm from this vaccine. And since it's not live, we didn't, were not concerned that it might travel to some other place and cause a side effect that way. And um, we had already previously demonstrated potency with these other approaches, and we could do it very, very rapidly and we had the team. So that's sort of the thinking behind it. We had the pieces, we had a platform that had been moved to the clinic before. It was, it's basically a, almost a plug and play. And we also felt this was a great place to demonstrate that. We could move something almost plug and play for uh, such a new pathogen that we didn't have approaches for. Another okay. reason not to use a live virus is you wanna use it in people that or are pregnant, or the vaccines do not work very well during pregnancy, or might get pregnant when you are vaccinating them. So having a live virus during pregnancy is, particularly if you know that a reversal of wild type can produce this, from their safety perspective, I think not very many pregnant women will, or women that can get potentially pregnant will want to do that. I mean, you can ask yourself and say, will I get a vaccine that if I get pregnant, I, it might have a problem. So the rubella vaccine we don't use during pregnancy because of that. Um, All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. That's right. So, so the, there was an article published um, in the New England Journal of Medicine by uh, Stan Plock and Adam Mahmood um, talking about the difficulty, asking for basically a, a global research development fund. And the reason that they asked for that is basically that there's three stages to making a vaccine. There's the research part, there's the research and development part, and then there's the implementation part. So they get progressively harder as you move along. Um, you can, it's, it's, it's easier, one could argue, to, to do the research, to develop something that works in animal models. And a very famous uh, Wistar researcher once said to me that, uh, that mice lie and monkeys exaggerate when you're in terms of doing animal <laughs> studies. That was David. Um, and, but what, what uh, Stanley and Adel described that second step as the valley of death for vaccines like this one, because it's very hard to do the research and development. It's often very expensive. Um, it's difficult to get um, pharmaceutical companies interested in doing that, especially for, for, vac for a vaccine that may not be used in a country universally like the United States, where basically you make your money off vaccines. So, so how do you get through this, what they describe as the valley of death, which is to say the research of development? So, so uh, thank you, Paul. And, and let, me, let me begin by you know, thanking Dave and, and Anita and Paul for the invitation. I've sat on the other side many, many times, and it's, a, it's really a privilege to be on this side uh, speaking to a distinguished audience. Uh, I think you touched, and what I would add on top of what you just said, Paul, is, is uh, especially in response to sort of a global health emergency. It's hard enough developing vaccines when you have all the time in the world to do it. Uh, when there's an emergency raging around you, how do you, how do you contract timelines, development timelines? How do you, uh, you know, how do, how do you speed up? This is an Olympic year. How do you go faster, stronger, higher, uh, all at the same time? And this is really, uh, this sort of brings up this notion of translational research that that is where the, uh, the rubber meets the road and, and you translate uh, fundamental research ideas into products. Uh, so, so to answer your question, Paul, I mean, as a, as a company uh, focused on developing products, uh, there's really three reasons why companies get into uh, product development. Uh, you've, you've got a multiple different products that you're developing. In response to a global emergency, you're gonna add another product into that development pipeline. 
And so what are some of the decisions that you need to take and then how do you take them? So the three criteria that, you know, that everybody grapples with, uh, the number one is there has to be a very clear unmet medical need. And I think uh, Pablo and Gary uh, clearly demonstrated Zika, I mean, very clearly met that need. The second uh, decision uh, as you go down this uh, flow chart is uh, the technology platform to develop a, a product. And, uh, and so David uh, highlighted the, uh, the unique aspects, features of DNA vaccines that allow us to uh, develop a product, uh, you know, and we can go through the features uh, in more detail. And the third piece is the resources to do it. So whether it is uh, people, facilities, and more, most importantly, capital. And, and you brought up this notion of capital. How do you, uh, how do you access capital? Uh, but, but, and on top of that, you fundamentally have to believe that you are in the best position to do something about, uh, about, about uh, whatever it is that you're facing. And, and Zika presented us uh, with this with this uh, sort of the perfect storm, if you will, uh, there was uh, all we met internally. We, you know, it was it was so almost like a a no brainer. Uh, you know, David, uh, Joseph, and and the team. We got together, and this was as we started seeing uh, hints of uh, these reports coming out of uh, out of the Caribbean, out of Brazil. Uh, we we said we need to do something about it, and this is. And we, would, we can be the first to uh, move a product into the clinic. And so it was that commitment uh, coupled with, uh, with a technology platform that had been validated uh, through our phase one clinical trials to show that we can drive immune responses, uh, I'm sorry, phase two clinical studies. We can drive immune responses, get T cells and B cells, antibodies, neutralize, neutralizing antibodies. We can uh, ensure we can make an impact on, on, on disease. So it was, a, it was really the coalition of the three uh, things coming together that allowed us to move, uh, move quickly. Uh, I think to touch upon funding, the, uh, you know, notice in the three points that I characterized, uh, commercial aspirations were, were not one of the uh, decision-making criteria for us. Uh, because when it comes to public health emergencies, uh, there, is a, there is a higher imperative uh, you know, there is a moral imperative as well. When you're in a position to do something, uh, make an impact, uh, you have to take that step and, and, uh, and make that impact. Uh, and and this, this doesn't present itself in, in, uh, in, in all cases, but certainly when it comes to infectious disease and vaccine development, uh, there, is a, there is a moral imperative on top of the commercial and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, market considerations. Uh, so let me let me pause there. And when it comes to finances, you know this is this is a uh, vaccine program where uh, companies I think have the wherewithal to to do the preclinical development, to do the uh, uh, to do the phase one studies. Uh, we can we can put out the five ten million dollars needed to do the preclinical and phase one clinical studies. Where uh, whereas uh, as Adil and and Stan pointed out. Where you run into the, uh, uh, the value of debt and the escalating capital requirements is in that translation from a successful phase one to a successful proof of concept phase two efficacy study. And that requires uh, bringing in you know, uh, tens of millions of dollars, uh, 20 to $50 million, which, uh, and this is where you know, we need, there's a significant need to bring in uh, capital structures that allow for uh, bridging that gap. Once you have proof of concept, once you have a clinical efficacy, uh, there's a whole lot of different stakeholders who are, who are ready to jump in and, uh, and then uh, do that late stage commercial development. So let me pause here and then I'll, I'm happy to share other thoughts uh, as we go through the discussion. Okay, thank you. Gary, you had, you had some data also on, on vaccine stuff too, didn't you, for that you yeah, could yeah. like to present? I mean, make sure. Yeah, so uh, it's not that actually. If you go one more. Well, you can start with that. Yeah. That's, I know you don't think that's an important organ. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah. only interested yeah. in one yeah. organ, which you will get to. So you'll understand what he shows the next slide. So this is vaccine effect <laughs> for on the cart on the um, figure 
the blue line, which is 100%, so no mice death with the vaccine. Without the vaccine, this mice group that actually Gary helped develop this model um, in his lab, uh, they're mice that get sick from Zika. They uh, mostly all die from the infection. So if you vaccinate them, they don't die. And then this side shows all those uh, little spots are inflammation of the brain. That's non-vaccinated brain, and on this side is vaccinated brain, no inflammation. So the vaccine protects the brain and keeps them alive. Not as important as what Gary's going to show in the <laughs> next slide. <laughs> so let, let me let, let me backtrack a little bit actually to highlight one thing, is that we and all the media say Zika infections is 80% asymptomatic, and as my friend Joel Maslow at the back. Dr. Maslow pointed out, this is from one study that had enrolled just over 260 people, and so it's very limited data, meaning that this estimate of 80%, you have to understand that if they are asymptomatic, how do you know? Because they don't even know they are infected if they are truly asymptomatic, right? So it has to be a very tight study, which is highly depending on, on diagnostic, which itself today are imperfect tools. Uh, so this is a growth estimate. And it's bringing back the question, what are the real consequences of a Zika infection as the virus evolved from the, the, the transition from Africa to Southeast Asia to, um, to the Americas? And one thing we realized about four or five months ago is that, uh, and I guess they invited me to talk about the, the funny part of it, so to speak, it's not that funny. As <coughs> fact. But when I saw this picture last week, I'm like, this is interesting because Zika is only a level two pathogen, which means that it's a biosafety level two, which means it's considered as low, 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 uh, low risk. Uh, it goes to all to level four. Level four is a spacesuit, basically. Um, so I'm, I'm, I was thinking, but he's completely overboard somehow. Or he understood something that it took us, that we know from where we've been accumulating data, and that another team also has, uh, has uh, communicated last week. And if you go to the next slide, is that as a matter of fact, Zika now is official is in animals, that is, not in humans, uh, <coughs> but it's, it's really causing severe damage in uh, the, uh, testicles, male testicles. And so if you advance this more, um, this, this is in red showing uh, animals that are infected in the size of the testis, how quickly within 20, 28 days, so within a month, they not, it started the normal size, so it's not, uh, uh, preventing growth, so to speak, in a young animal growing, it's actively causing uh, damage to decrease. And, and if you go one more time, uh, what you see on the left is actually infected animals and a normal animal's uh, testis from the left. And, one more, and, and so w what is this doing? Well, it's affecting fertility, obviously. And so what is the big question now is that these babies are the born, but also the one, if you think about the male, less than five years old or maybe less than 10 years old, or maybe less than 15 years old, what's gonna happen to their, their uh, ability to have babies later on? Are we gonna wake up in five years or 10 years or 15 years or 20 years with fertility in males completely crashing down and you know, maybe making the link at that point? So be just, uh, um, just realize this, these are animal data from mice, mice lie, but this kind of lie I take seriously personally, being a male on top of it. Uh, if you go one more, uh, and, and so what's the beauty with this vaccine, uh, from my perspective, uh, in addition to protecting the, 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 the most important organs, that is the brain. <laughs> we didn't think so a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you I was going a, to... a guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe this is going to also open up the funding part, right? But we'll see about that. Won't fund the brain. <laughs> But so what you see is the, what's called the PRME at the top is actually vaccinated animals compared to control at the bottom, so the size, uh, so the vaccine can, can uh, protect um, the testes from this damaging effect from Zika infection. Um, and that's it. I mean, the rest is way so you see different animals. So the green are protected animal from the vaccine and the red are uh, control animal that are not protected. So, so again, like the real uh, impact of this uh, clear phenomenon in animals, in humans is being investigated. We, um, we, took the, we made a decision three months ago, actually, when we really had what we thought were sufficient data. We passed on the data to WHO, and uh, the paper just came out, I think, a week or two ago, 
Um, they told me, actually, uh, two weeks ago I was in Geneva, and they told me, uh, uh, they thanked me because they passed the information to Brazil, where, you know, there's a lot of uh, ongoing transmission, although it went down, uh, and they've been looking at it. Uh, so these are now, you know, real public health issues that are being looked at. So uh, um, I think, I think to, um, I, I think this is a very important statement. A lot of public health agencies uh, uh, from different countries have taken the decision to, uh, and the, uh, the approach of saying, um, you know, it, let, let it go through the population. Most of the infection are asymptomatic. Population will become immune and the, the transmission will stop. Well, I will tell you this to me is a very uh, unfortunate approach to public health because uh, if this is the approach, then we can stop all vaccination and say, well, let's all these viruses and bacteria go through the population until the, the one that, that get through you know, are strong enough, and I, you know, it doesn't matter so much how screwed up they are, they are alive, and, uh, and we're good. Well, I don't think that's the approach. The approach is to have options, including vaccine, and it doesn't mean that everybody does get vaccinated. It means that if there's an emergency, if there's a real problem, that we have those options to consider uh, to use. All right, I'm, so, I'm going to ask one last question and then turn so, it over to the so, audience. So, Paul, can I, yes, can yes, I just sorry, sorry, uh, this, yes. this, this last comment and maybe ask the panel this? So, uh, clearly, we've seen uh, effects in, in uh, you know, pregnant women and, 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 uh, and, and newborn children, and now we're seeing effects in men. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, what, what do you guys think about, is, is Zika going to be considered a universal vaccine? Would it get, uh, is that the level of... Uh, uh, urgency or an emergency? What, what would the what does the panel think in terms of wh where how, where we, where would we see the vaccine make the greatest impact? So I think we should ask Paul that he's been on the ACID, yes. so I think he has. If it, it, it's so, I mean, it, as it stands, if you had a Zika vaccine now, yes. I think it would be it would be a traveler's vaccine like a cholera vaccine or a typhoid vaccine. It's not a common disease in the United States. I think it's unlikely to be a common disease in the United States because Aedes aegypti, mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti is, is the more, is the better uh, agent at transmitting it. And Aedes aegypti, which transmits chikungunya and dengue is in, you know, it's in Florida, it's in Texas, it's in Louisiana a little bit, but that's it. If Aedes albopictus was also an efficient transmitter, then that moves you up into another 30 states. Mm -hmm. And then it, it could, in theory, be a, a uh, a universal vaccine for children in the United States. Uh, the analogy you can make, actually, is to the enterovirus D68. So this right. is a virus which is a, it's a polio-like virus, and it causes polio-like symptoms. There's been outbreaks in Colorado. There's been outbreaks in Philadelphia. We've seen a number of children in our hospital with, with, ED, with enterovirus D68. Were that to be, become a more common infection, you could see that as a universal vaccine in, 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 uh, for, for uh, infants in the United, or for children in the United States. That's what would have to have, would have to be more common. So right now it would be a traveler's vaccine, which, you know, as we said earlier, is not going to be right. a, a, a big vaccine. The other issue I think that, that has to be addressed is who are you testing it in? I mean, if you're, you know, is it, is it endemic enough that you, that, you know, you can introduce it into a population knowing that the virus is circulating commonly and you can see whether you present a, prevent asymptomatic infection with good diagnostic testing or symptomatic infection with good clinical testing. But you, I don't think you can give, you can do a human challenge study with Zika sure. virus because it causes sure. Guillain-Barre syndrome. Even if it's rare, you still can't do that study. Right. So that makes this a little more challenging in terms of doing clinical studies. Right, but, the, but the, I mean, as, as every day we are hearing more and more complications. So, uh, I mean, I think the, I guess the disease burden might drive some of that as well, in addition to the, uh, you know, the, the vector uh, shift from one vector to the other. Yeah. Also, the attack rate in Puerto Rico is significant. Right, but see, what ends up, and that's true. And so, so good, so go test it now, because what's going to happen is a large percentage of the population will become immune, and then it's become much hard, it becomes much harder to test it. I think we don't know the answer, because if it affects fertility down the road, the argument for a universal vaccine becomes stronger. We know that the virus is eliminated through the sperm for months in males that get infected. In fact, we advise people that got natural infection not to get pregnant not to impregnate anybody for six months because the virus is eliminated. At least you can detect it with PCR. With, you can detect the RNA of the virus in the semen for up to six months, maybe longer. So you can, that male can infect the women. Uh, and so we, re we recommend to avoid impregnation for six months. 
but if it affects down the road fertility, so if you have a whole population that is going to be less fertile, then the argument for a universal vaccination becomes much stronger because you're going to affect a whole generation of people. So but we don't know what is going to be the proper target. Okay, let, let's take questions from the audience. We have about, about a little more than 15 minutes left. So, and we, we have a microphone for this gentleman right here. Wait, well, wait, wait for the microphone so everybody can hear you. Why do you think microcephaly was not detected earlier while virus still in Africa or Asia, either among local population or among susceptible visitors, which I'm pretty sure? That's a, that's a very good question. I'll turn it over to our clinical specialist. So the question, I guess, is why, why uh, I mean, microcephaly was seen clearly in Brazil, but the virus had been isolated and detected as early as uh, 1947. I think it's a question of numbers. So the biggest epidemic was in the Jap Island, around 8,000 cases. If you look at the risk, it's relatively low. So of the 8,000, 4,000 would be women. How many were pregnant? So they saw some cases of, of microcephaly, but they were, when they saw them, they thought, well, this is a sporadic case. And in Brazil, in the northern part of Brazil, in, in, in a province there, they start seeing many cases of, of microcephaly. And that's when they clinically, they associated it with Zika infection. And they went back to, in the, uh, to the Jap Island in, in Micronesia. And then they saw that there was an increase in microcephaly after the epidemic. Yeah, but there is an India, for example, on the web. There are many people in India. They think they only, I mean, there are many visitors to India. There's no infection in India. India. There's no infection, an outbreak in Zika infection in India. There has been some cases in Vietnam recently, but it, it, there were some cases many years ago in India, but the big epidemic was in the Jap, in the Micronesia uh, the, in the late 90s. No, 2000 and, and some, yeah. yeah. Well, Gary, Gary had one comment. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to add also because, you know, there was, the virus has been circulating in Africa for a long time. That's a place I've been working for several years. And so why have we not seen any, any uh, manifestation of Zika infection? Well, actually, you know, the healthcare systems in general are so weak that they will not detect uh, anything else than a nuclear explosion, basically, right? Um, and, and honestly, nobody, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but nobody cares very much. And so the impact on fertility and the impact on microcephaly um, in, uh, in Africa will not be detected unless you will reach such a rate that it will be like common to anybody to see on the street. But with, you know, the mic microcephaly, it's not, uh, look at the numbers, they're not very high. So they were captured in Brazil. That uh, also, it, side by side to the fact that the strains have evolved. And actually in animal studies, the strains from, that are circulating in Brazil are more virulent than the strain from Africa, for now. What does it mean in human? It's open to discussion, but at least for, for what we can believe from animal, uh, it's, uh, there's a difference. Further to that question or the, the, that comment, I wanted to know, over time and in the various different travels around the world, has the virus mutated? Has it gotten worse? Some, the animal studies support that, that concept, yeah that, the, the, again, the strain that were compared between uh, Brazil and, uh, and actually Port Puerto Rico and uh, the African strain, we have strains from Africa and even from mosquitoes from Africa and uh, from Southeast Asia and from Brazil, and the strains have mutated, and the strains, they are not completely day and night difference, but they are more virulent than animals. When you look at uh, the, actually the, the, the defect or the, uh, the damage to the brain as well. This, this is published now. So that's, that figures from your experiments, Gary? This one? Uh, this one, yeah. So you know, all this delay in Congress, you know, most of the Congress are men, 535. Uh, no, no, I've thought about this. This is a powerful right? argument. You know, that would have been 1.4 billion or 1.1 billion. That would have been like 14 billion. <laughs> and that would have been passed like in May. So yeah. that should have been published, Gary. So we, well, let's, let's still publish it. So, but you, you're raising a, a, a good point that is sad somehow, and, but it's a reality that people that are voting those budget uh, are not pregnant women and are not uh, the, the, the newborn. And so they are 
you know, in majority males, and uh, they may maybe put more attention to it now, <laughs> or when we publish it, hopefully very soon, we're hoping in the next, uh, you know, few yeah, months. Yeah, oh, oh, just thing aside, I, I think it is, I mean, it's the first uh, mosquito-borne virus to be sexually transmittable, right? So it does expand, uh, uh, and, uh, and up to six months. I mean, Pablo said stopping the impregnation, but it's actually you should stop having unprotected sex for six months. So um, it, it does implicate the transmittability a little further. So yeah, I think things like this and, and how the disease will track in Puerto Rico will impact what kind of funding, whether it's through what Paul was saying about CEPI, that uh, uh, that's a coalition for, what was that stand for? Epidemic preparedness. Uh, anyway, that's the funding that Naranjan was talking about. There's a global um, coalition that's evolving to have a uh, few hundred million dollars available to fight the known unknown uh, pathogens, uh, prepare for the development of products and vaccines for those. Yeah. So um, I think in January at, in Davos, there's supposed to be some uh, uh, d devotion of uh, commitment of some large sums of money uh, to al at least launch this uh, concept. So mm -hmm. to to bridge the value of of death uh, in product development and vaccines. Thank you. So two more. Let's get Bruce and then this woman back here. Is that okay? Do it that way. And then we'll, we'll there was a, the the radiologist will get you eventually. Don't worry. <laughs> I have two questions. What does the um, immune response look like in the normal situation if they don't get Jalan Barre? Uh, does the immune response eliminate the, the virus, number one? And number two, in the animal model, is there actual evidence that you're killing neuronal regenerative cells? So, let me down. Go ahead, but you, you have to follow that part. So the immune, immune response um, does eliminate the virus. I mean, we don't have, I'm unaware of any cases of people being infected without an immune response at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Who have then longer term infection. Um, I, we do not know why 20% only of people infected with Zika have symptoms. It might be due to minor differences in the immune response or not that allows them to have symptoms and allow viral replication to increase to where they see symptoms, we don't know that. Um, but the immune response um, in the animals clearly clears the infection because if you knock out the immune response, there's just, uh, yeah. data is Gary showing, they, it can last 21, 28 days in the mice that don't die. So, and uh, those are experiments just to mention some other people, uh, Sagar and Hedy also participated in from my lab. So um, with Gary and Brian, um, so, we clearly have that evidence as well. And what was the second question? About the, um, the animal models that you're actually seeing. Uh, so we did not look, but others have already reported that. Others have reported the infection uh, eliminating uh, progenitor cells. Uh, I, I have heard through the grapevine there's evidence, but I've not seen it. A natural infection knows. protects you from Another infection. This is not like dengue virus that you have four flavors of, I mean, four serotypes. So when you get Zika, you only get it once. And, you ha and that gives also hopes to develop a vaccine because if natural infection protects you, then a vaccine theoretically should protect you. So I have two questions. Um, the first is at what point when you're starting to try to get pregnant do you recommend getting tested um, and is insurance covering it? Um, say two people who reported that their insurance wasn't covering it or their um, GYNs wouldn't test them. Um, and then the second question is, have you seen any reports of patients who have orthopedic complications without microcephaly? I have not seen that many cases of Zika. I, so pregnancy, who should be tested for Zika? The question, any pregnant woman that has traveled to an endemic area, right should be tested for Zika. And how do you test for Zika is if you have seen, it's not that easy to diagnose. So you have symptoms, if you're presenting like the Guatemalan student, then you can do a PCR. You can look for the virus, 
in the blood or in the urine. In the urine, the virus is eliminated for a longer period of time, so you're gonna get a positive test faster, and that's how she was diagnosed. But the virus goes away, and then you test for an, the antibody response from the woman to the virus. You use an IgM, it's called, a, it's an ELISA test, that it, and that is, it works for around 12 weeks. And after that, it becomes a little bit more complicated because uh, the IgG is, there is cross-reactivity with other viruses, and then you have to send it to the CDC for neutralization titers, and it becomes more complicated. But if you're a pregnant woman that have traveled to an endemic area, and that includes Miami, some areas of Miami, you should be tested for Zika if you have symptoms, okay? And it's nerve-wracking for anybody that is in that situation. If you have sex with somebody that was in an endemic area, also you should be te tested. That's the, okay. the groups of population that you is recommended to test. So, so, so just one uh, follow-up comment. I mean, that it sort of unders underscores the bigger issue with an emerging infectious disease. And until you know earlier in, in the summer, uh, the guidelines for testing were essentially you could only test high-risk populations. And so if I wanted, for instance, if I wanted to see, you know, I've traveled to India, I've traveled all over the glo world, uh, getting bitten by mosquitoes is, not, is sort of second nature here. If I wanted to see if I, were, I had seroconverted to Zika, I had no mechanism to get myself tested in the U.S. because the guidelines didn't support it. And then the guidelines didn't support it because uh, capacity wasn't there. And as Pablo mentioned, the CDC had to verify test results. There only, I think only one lab or two labs in LA do it. Europe has been a little more uh, progressive and permissive about testing. So I would have been better off going to Amsterdam to get tested. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an issue. Uh, and then developers, uh, countermeasure developers working with diagnostics, working with uh, regulators, working, and then the insurance companies will, will provide coverage. Uh, I mean, speaking of countermeasures, when you're looking at developing, so the, the, the bigger challenge for us is uh, the next Zika comes along, what do you do, right? How do you, how do you respond to it? So clearly uh, diagnostics is one part of it. Uh, validated platforms, vaccine development, how do we speed it up? So getting validated platforms ready with a strong safety profile pre-demonstrated pre uh, so that David mentioned the plug and play approach. Uh, that's that's critical. Uh, pre pre epidemic preparation. You know, building capacity, uh, building. Uh, uh, you know, getting that infrastructure organized that can be modular. That you can use the same facilities for making multiple products, and and, and agencies like BARDA uh, are supporting that sort of a vision. And then uh, you know the essential ingredients also become. Uh, do you, have you assembled a team that has worked well together? One of the success stories for us on the Zika program was that the team that we put together to, to develop this vaccine had worked, uh, you know, David and Gary and Pablo uh, and, and uh, VGXI and Gene One. We had all worked together previously on, on Ebola. We had worked together on, on, on HIV. Uh, and and this, this, so that translational effort, having, building that army and training that army in peacetime is what's going to help you when there is in, in war. So the number of ingredients come in, and, and we shouldn't forget diagnostics as, and, and surveillance as being part of that as well. Okay, so it actually is 7:30. Is that okay? So, so I know you had a question. So if you don't mind just coming up and asking, so we can we can respect everybody's time. Because I know everybody's got to get home and pack and get their passports in order. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you for your time. <laughs> so just a quick thank you to Paul for moderating. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. And thank you to the panel as well.